But a bitter feud with another man would ensure he was denied the recognition he truly deserved. Using his own diaries, this is the story of the last and greatest Tomb Raider, Giovanni Belzoni. found so many erroneous accounts have been given of my discoveries in Egypt that it is my duty to publish a plain statement of fact. The motives by which I was induced to accumulate the various remains of antiquity will become clear. Belzoni was a looter, he was a plunderer, he used unorthodox methods, he used battering rams. But he really can be seen as one of the fathers of Egyptology. I agreed to use my best efforts, being happy at all times to increase the British Museum with the products of my exertions. But his own roots lay far from the establishment stronghold of the British Museum. Italian by birth, the son of a barber. He first came to England at the age of 24. A giant of a man standing six foot seven, he started his career as part of a circus act. He has this great classic act of bearing all these people around on a kind of harness across his shoulders. But he's not just a great hulk, a, a strong man. I mean, he's a very, very intelligent man with a, an extremely inquiring mind. Belzoni was a thinking man. He saw himself not as a circus freak, but a man of science. His passions were travel and the new sciences, optics, electricity, engineering, and hydraulics. Complex hydraulic constructions even became part of his act. But the crowds wanted the massive presence of a strong man, not the invisible hand of an engineer. Though a flop with his audience, these inventions would prompt a decision that would change the course of his life. I could not halt the course of my obsession with hydraulics. If I was to be recognized as a scientist, then it would no longer be in the circus, but in the field of learning. In 1815, the lure of an engineering career drew Belzoni to leave England and start a new life on another continent. He has this meeting, which seems to be completely by chance, with the Pasha of Egypt's man in Malta and the Pasha is on the lookout for, for new technology. Of course, Belzoni has by now considerable experience in hydraulics, and he thinks he's the man to help the Pasha out. Belzoni had prepared detailed plans for a water wheel to irrigate the Nile Valley. Now bound for Egypt, for the first time in his life, he was being taken seriously as an engineer. Cairo in 1815 was like nothing Belzoni had ever seen before. In the 19th century, Egypt was in a great state of flux. There's been a revolution following the French invasion, 1798, British invasion after that. British and French were both chased out by a new ruler called Muhammad Ali, who rises suddenly in this power vacuum to take control of the country. Seeking to consolidate his power, the Pasha granted permission to both sides to search for and remove the treasures of the ancient world. So the British and French remained bitter rivals, making Egypt a dangerous place to be. But to Belzoni, it was a land of breathtaking beauty filled with opportunity. 
I could not restrain myself from going to see the wonder of the world. The scene here is majestic and grand. A mist over the plains of Egypt formed a veil which vanished gradually as the sun rose and unveiled to the view that beautiful land. But Belzoni had an engineering career to pursue. Reaching agreement with the Pasha, he erected his water wheel in the grounds of the palace. My machine was set to work, and although constructed in bad wood by Arabian carpenters, it drew six or seven times more water than the common machines. It does seem as if it did work, the water wheel. It was unfortunate because his servant broke his leg while they set it in motion, and there were vested interests in Egypt which didn't seem to want it to succeed. So it fails, and that is a great blow. So much for the Pasha's encouragement of European engineers. They are enticed into his service, but are soon left to bewail their credulity. His dreams of becoming an engineer dashed. Belzoni turned instead to exploration. Needing assistance and protection, he approached a man who would change the course of his life, the newly appointed British consul to Egypt, Henry Salt. Henry Salt was a highly educated, sophisticated gentleman who went to Egypt as a representative of the British government and as a very important side to make his fortune. Salt's instructions from the British government were simple. Locate the best antiquities and send them home. But the ambitious Salt had a more lucrative plan in mind. Find the best treasures, but sell them to the British Museum. His first target was the huge granite bust of Ozymandias, Pharaoh Ramesses II. Located at Thebes, 500 miles to the south, it was not a task the genteel Salt wished to undertake himself. He needed to hire a strong man, someone with nothing to lose. On March the 12th, 1815, the destitute Belzoni was invited to the consulate. Salt was impressed. He is of extraordinary muscular powers well-skilled in mechanics, indefatigable and zealous in whatever he undertakes, and joining to all this, a very intelligent mind. I told the consul I would be happy to undertake the removal of the bust without the smallest view of interest, as he told me it was to go to the British Museum. Salt agreed to meet half the cost of the expedition. Belzoni was given 25 pounds and a list of instructions including the advice not to drop it in the Nile. Every detail was covered, except one. When they first meet, and Beldoni is introduced to Salt, he signs a contract to work, he thinks, for Britain and the British government. Henry Salt sees that the contract is between himself Henry Salt as a private man, and Giovan Battista Belzoni. So there are the seeds of a misunderstanding, and it's an enormous one. Whatever Salt may have believed, Belzoni was quite clear about the agreement. I beg leave to observe that in the whole of my instructions, not a word is said about any payment to myself which would certainly have been the case had I been employed in the way that has been represented. Belzoni hired a boat and set sail for Thebes on the 30th of June. It was not long before he got his first sight of the opposition. Salt had referred to the French in passing, 
but had neglected to mention that they were armed and dangerous. Three weeks after leaving Cairo, Belzoni arrived at his destination. Carefully avoiding his rivals, he paid a visit to the temples of Karnak and Luxor. It appeared to me like entering a city of ancient giants, who after a long conflict were all destroyed, leaving the ruins of their temples as the only proof of their existence. But Belzoni's prize lay not in the temples of the East Bank, but on the other side of the river, in the spectacular surroundings of the Ramesseum Temple. I was lost in the contemplation of so many objects that for a time was unconscious whether I were on terrestrial ground or on some other planet. Following Salt's instructions, here Belzoni found the gigantic bust of Ozymandias. Near the remains of its body and chair lay the head with its face turned upwards and apparently smiling at me at the thought of being taken to England. I was not surprised by the size of the object, but its beauty, which was beyond description. But how to move it? Seven and a half tons, five miles to the Nile. The French had already tried by placing dynamite in the bust to detach it from its torso. Now it was up to Belzoni and the British to succeed, where the French had failed. His method was simple, but brilliant. He doesn't use wheels which would get stuck in the sand. He actually moves it the way ancient Egyptians themselves would have moved large uh, lumps of stone around on a sledge and just using manpower. The local Arab chief called him Magnoon, mad, but agreed to lend him 80 workers. But pray, he said smilingly, have you a scarcity of stones in Europe that you come here to fetch them away? Local people had no uh, regard for these things. They were the work of infidels, of a culture that existed before Islam. Once out of the temple, good progress was made. In the next three weeks, they pulled the head two miles. It was a massive achievement. Belzoni decided to paint the scene for posterity. What's interesting in everything he does is not just the explorer and the adventurer, but the showman. So when he paints, he paints bigger and more dramatic than the event warrants. Progress was satisfactory, but Belzoni was not yet in the clear. He had now reached the Nile's floodplain, and this was dangerous. By mid-July, the Nile would flood, and the head could be lost to the swollen river. The pace increased, but so did the temperature. Belzoni's strength began to fail him. I never felt the sun so powerful before in my life. Being in the hottest season, the air was inflamed and the wind on fire. Belzoni had ophthalmia, sun blindness. The locals took pity and treated him with a medicine based on a recipe of garlic and herbs. But for three weeks he couldn't see a thing. And all the time Ozymandias was sitting near the Nile with the flood season fast approaching. 
When Belzoni recovered, he learned that the local chief would no longer supply his labor force. This called for a drastic solution. I went straight to the Kachev and demanded an explanation. He replied they would sooner starve than undertake a task so arduous as yours. Belzoni solved the problem with a bribe although he was careful not to hand over any bullets. Belzoni has a pretty schizophrenic attitude toward the Egyptians. But without them, there's no way that he could have achieved what he did achieve. And part of his success was that he organizes them into a usable and very effective labor force. The workers returned the following day. On the 30th, we continued work and the Colossus advanced 150 yards toward the Nile. On the 10th and 11th, we approached the river. And on the 12th, thank God, Ozymandias arrived on the bank of the Nile. It was a spectacular triumph. As soon as the head was safely on the boat, Belzoni sent a message to Salt, telling him of his success. To the British consul in Cairo, I am pleased to relate that Ozymandias has begun its journey to England. Salt was delighted. He wrote a report for the London papers, automatically claiming full credit for the achievement. To him, Belzoni was merely a hired hand. By the indefatigable labors of Mr. Salt, the British Museum is to become the richest depository of Egyptian antiquities in the world. Deep in the heart of Egypt, Belzoni had no way of knowing what had been done. But he was proving much more than the hired hand that Salt had intended. At the celebrations that followed the removal of the bust, he was anointed by the very people who, a month before, had seen only a madman. In Egypt, at least, Belzoni was fast becoming a legend. Buoyed by his success with the head of Ozymandias, Salt sent Belzoni to gather more antiquities. For Salt, the intention was to amass a collection that he could sell to the highest bidder for his own personal gain. Belzoni, on the other hand, assumed he was working entirely for the benefit of the British Museum. I was not rich, but I had no other view than to serve the nation at large. All the time evading the French, Belzoni travelled up and down the Nile on a collecting spree. And as time went on, his fascination with ancient Egypt increased. I could not help but wonder how a nation which was once so great as to erect these stupendous edifices could so far fall into oblivion that even their languages and writing are totally unknown to us. I do not know that I ever quitted a place with so much regret, but my principal object would not permit me to stay here any longer. Belzoni's principal object was a place called Abu Simbel. He had heard a tale of a giant stone head poking through the sands. Ramesses II created there two temples, one dedicated to the main gods of Egypt, 
but most important of all, to the deified Ramesses himself. Historically, the two temples combined are a landmark in the archaeology, the architecture, and the history of ancient Egypt. Belzoni was joined by two English naval officers, James Irby and Charles Mangles. For the past 10 years, they had been fighting the French on the high seas and had acquired a taste for it. What attracted them to Abu Simbel was not only the stone heads, but also the chance of a fight with the French who were moving into the area Belzoni was now leaving. Keeping one step ahead of their rivals, two weeks later, Belzoni and the naval officers arrived unimpeded in Abu Simbel. Beneath this massive dune, Belzoni was convinced that they would find a hidden temple. A group of locals was hired to help, but the season was against them. It was now midsummer. For three weeks we labored on the dune. At that time of the year, the heat was intense, and digging in the sand was like trying to make a hole in water. The holy month of Ramadan came, and the locals left. Then the heat got the better of Irby and Mangles. And finally, Belzoni gave in. On the 27th of June, we consumed the last of our supplies. I became convinced that if I did not find the entrance soon, then the sand would have defeated us. I registered the heat at 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Back in Cairo, as he waited for news from Belzoni, Salt was also finding the heat intolerable. I'm sorry to say that Cairo by no means agrees with me. In the months of July and August, it is a perfect furnace. To stagnate thus at a distance from all science, literature, arts, delicacy and taste is a punishment almost sufficient to drive one mad. In Abu Simbel, Belzoni had found the solution. He got buckets of water from the Nile and wet the sand, and he built palisades, I think, with bits of palm tree to keep the sand away. And, and so gradually they managed to work their way down um, towards the entrance. Three more weeks of intense effort followed. They were driven on now by the tantalizing prospect of unearthing a great temple. At last, on August the 1st, 1817, they found the entrance. It was just a small incision in the rock, but wide enough for the three men to squeeze through. They had entered the vast rock-cut temple of Abu Simbel, domain of the great Ramesses II. The first to walk there in over 3,000 years. But amidst all this splendor, the great Belzoni, would prove more than a mere plunderer. He measures very carefully the distance between one statue and another. He builds up a plan of the temple. He actually reproduces on paper what he has seen. So in a way, 
you could say that this is part of the evolution of the man. It is part of him beginning to behave like a proper archaeologist. Finally, forced to leave by the intense heat, the three men signed off in style. From Abu Simbel, Belzoni returned alone to Thebes. But the situation there had changed dramatically since the summer. Realizing that they now had serious competition, the French had intensified their operations. Belzoni returned to see his own stockpile of antiquities smashed up. It had become an international war of plunder. When Belzoni arrived, he was quickly spotted, and the cry went up. But the bullet missed, and Belzoni escaped unharmed. He asked Henry Salt for government protection. Salt's reply left him reeling. My dear Belzoni, I do not agree with you in considering this to be a national insult or as having anything to do with my consular character. You must be aware that you are not at present engaged in any official employ. It is absolutely necessary that this should be explicitly understood. I am collecting for myself, and you are acting in a private capacity. Belzoni felt he had been completely misled, and Salt's reply left him alone and vulnerable. He left the temples of the East Bank to the French and headed for the relative safety of the burial grounds on the opposite side of the Nile. Here, in this vast necropolis, were the people of Kurna. For centuries, they had lived among the mummies and tombs of the ancient Egyptians. Belzoni struck an immediate rapport. He lives with the people of Kurna, and he talks about living in adapted tombs and, and mortuary temples, and, and he lives there amongst the sheep and the families. They tell him stories. He picks up uh, local knowledge from them of where to look and where to dig. Kerna tomb robbery was not a subtle art. But with the assistance of Belzoni and his homemade battering ram, it could be a very effective one. I succeeded in obtaining admission into any cave where mummies were to be seen. It was truly impossible to give any description of those subterranean abodes and their inhabitants. I could not pass without putting my face in contact with that of some decaying Egyptian, could not avoid being covered with legs and arms and heads rolling from above. While his Kerner companions went in search of gold, Belzoni had a very different goal. He began to collect papyri. Years later, these records would help scholars to piece together the history and belief system of ancient Egypt. The tomb raider had turned fledgling archaeologist. Whilst the hills around Kurna housed the tombs of the Egyptian aristocracy, 
a greater prize lay further west, hidden in a remote desert canyon. The Valley of the Kings. Here lay the tombs of the greatest pharaohs. Most had remained undisturbed, their location a long lost secret. Perhaps the constant observations I made in the Valley of the Kings enabled me to see what other travelers had missed. I often observed travelers who, confident of their own knowledge, let slip opportunities of ascertaining whether or not they were correct in their notions. He looks at the rocks, he looks at the way the sand moves, he looks at the dry river beds, and possibly because he had learned about hydraulics, he can actually read the valley. In just two weeks, Belzoni and his men found eight royal tombs. All right, let me down. All right. Then, on the 16th of October, 1817, Belzoni made a breathtaking discovery. It was the chamber of Seti I, pharaoh of the 18th dynasty and father of Ramesses II, who had reigned 1300 years before Christ. The tomb of Seti I remains to this day probably the grandest and the most important tomb in the Valley of the Kings. It's in a very, very bad state because flash flood has destroyed quite a lot of the painted surface. And of course, Belzoni recorded the tomb as it was. We entered a small chamber, which I gave the name Room of Beauties, for it is adorned with the most beautiful figures in Basso Realevo. Still further, the hall opens into a large vaulted chamber. The ceiling of the vault itself is painted blue with a procession of figures and other groups related to the zodiac. It was here that the body of the king was deposited. How can I describe my sensations at that moment? I seemed alone in the midst of all that is most sacred in the world. As Belzoni enjoyed his moment of triumph, his nemesis was approaching. Henry Salt, having heard the great news, was rushing to the Valley of the Kings to steal the show. He had with him a party of touring English aristocrats, Earl Belmore, his family and biographer. Salt immediately gave his friends a guided tour of the tomb, a place he himself was seeing for the first time. The Italian strongman was ignored. If an observation is made to them by anyone who had not the good fortune of having a classical education, they scorned to listen to it and replied with a smile, if not a laugh. Particularly here in Seti's tomb, where he's doing what he reckons is important scholarly work, it's particularly galling to be palmed off with this idea of the hired hand, the hired man of salt. This was the final straw. It is all for salt. I find these, if they are not for Belzoni, they are for no one. I finish. Belzoni stormed out of the valley and returned to Cairo. Once there, he went straight to the British consulate. In the yard, he found his entire collection amassed and ready to be shipped back to England.
On every sculpture, the same label. H. Salt. In the consul's study, the picture was even worse. Copies of the European reviews, praising the Salt Collection. It will be seen that Mr. Salt has been indefatigable in his researches. We rejoice to find that in return he has possessed himself of a rich harvest of long buried treasures. It is through the zeal, personal exertions and great pecuniary liberality of Mr. Salt that many of the hidden treasures of Egypt have come to light. We have few words to add respecting Belzoni, whose death has been announced in the public print. This is really a, a moment, a sort of final breakdown between the two men. Belzoni feels he's being cheated out of uh, recognition of, of his tomb. Determined not to leave Egypt without having made his mark, Belzoni returned to an old haunt, the Giza Plateau. There he gazed at the 4,500-year-old pyramid of Khafre. Legend said it was solid. Belzoni had a hunch it was not. He wanders around the second pyramid and comes to this brilliantly simple conclusion about where the entrance might be. A natural impulsion took me toward the south side of the pyramid. I examined every part and almost every stone. Then I came round to the north. Here, the appearance of things was somewhat different from that of any of the other sides. Having made this clear and simple observation, I found that if there were any chamber at all in the second pyramid, the entrance could not be in the center. But calculating by the passage in the first pyramid, the entrance would be nearer 30 feet to the east. This gave me no little delight, and hope returned to cherish my pyramidical brains. It took him just three weeks to crack the puzzle. Belzoni was treading the path of the pharaohs once again. I had the pleasure of finding myself in the way of the central chamber of one of the two great pyramids of Egypt. Belzoni had defied thousands of years of received wisdom and found his way to the core of the pyramid. Once there, he acted immediately. He goes and inscribes his name in enormous letters all over the inside of the chamber there, just to state that I, Belzoni, explorer, scholar, I discovered this, not Henry Salt. This was, this was me. Scoperta da G. Belzoni. Belzoni found it. But life in Egypt had become intolerable for him. Perhaps I have spoken too much of the obstacles thrown in my way, but I hope a little indulgence may be allowed. I was compelled to leave Egypt through the jealousy and intrigue of my adversaries before I had completed my plans. Five years before, England had known him as a circus strongman. Now he sought a very different type of recognition. He wants to be part of the British establishment. He wants to be considered as a great discoverer. He wants to be probably perceived as something of a scholar. The first thing he did was to write his narrative, a rollicking account of his Egyptian discoveries. This was his chance to settle an old score with Henry Salt. It has been erroneously stated that I was regularly employed by Mr. Salt, the consul of His Britannic Majesty in Egypt, for the purpose of bringing the colossal bust from Thebes. I positively deny that I was ever engaged by him in any shape whatever, either by words or writing. 
London warmed to this mysterious giant licking his wounds in public, much to the alarm of Henry Salt. As to his monopolizing the credit for these discoveries, I only have the merit of having risked the speculation and paid the expenses. Despite Salt's rebuttal, the narrative went into a second, then third edition, and then Belzoni's drawings and sketches were published to further acclaim. But the showman had one last great wonder to reveal. He decided to unwrap a mummy he had brought back from the Valley of the Kings. Only now, Belzoni's audience was not a raucous crowd, but doctors from the Royal College of Surgeons. It was the first mummy that London had ever seen, and it must have seemed that the recognition he had long sought was now assured. Belzoni moved the show to the Egyptian Hall in Piccadilly. Thousands came to see the artifacts he had brought back from Egypt. The statues, the sphinxes, the papyri. But the greatest attraction was the man himself, Giovanni Belzoni. The great lion, great in every sense, was the gigantic Belzoni, the handsomest man for a giant I'd ever seen. He seems a man of great simplicity, tells his pains and pleasures with the openness of a child. His story is like a fairy tale. The Duchess of Beaufort. The invitations rolled out and the grandees of Britain rolled in. Lady Lamb. Everybody wanted to be seen with the great explorer. When the show finally closed, Belzoni may have been able to look back at a box office success, but recognition as a scholar still eluded him. He wasn't British. He wasn't part of the very closed society of London. He is the curiosity of a year, and then they go on to look for something else. Suddenly, it was all over. He was replaced in Piccadilly by the elastic midget. So he approached the British Museum and asked them to buy the Belzoni collection. But the museum was not interested. It already had the greatest of Belzoni's finds, deposited by Henry Salt. Snubbed, he turned to what he did best, exploration. He looked again to the continent of Africa. He'd unlocked its past. Now he wanted the key to its heart, the source of the river Niger and the mythical city of Timbuktu. In 1822, Belzoni set off on his last quest. But he never completed his journey. On Christmas Eve, 1823, he died from dysentery in the desert. He was 800 miles from Timbuktu. He left behind a legacy which is only now receiving the recognition he had always believed he deserved. Belzoni is really a watershed in the history of Egyptology because he represents something totally new and totally different. 
he started examining things and most important he learned and he applied whatever he learned to the next place where he went so he does represent perhaps the end of the adventurers the treasure seekers people who just go there to make a fast buck and the beginning of more scientific Egyptology. The year of Belzoni's death, the young English poet Shelley first saw the great bust of Ramesses II. His poem, Ozymandias, was a tribute to an ancient civilization and an obituary for the man who had retrieved it. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Belzoni's greatest discoveries remain inside the British Museum as the Salt Collection. There's loads more to discover about ancient Egypt on the BBC I website. Go to bbc.co.uk slash history. And staying with ancient Egypt next this evening, the rise and fall explores the events which led to the collapse of the great civilization. That's here on BBC Two in just a moment. <laughs> 